Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Khaled Dulgindi. I'm director of MEI's Palestine program, and I'm delighted to be hosting today's very special event, uh, the Palestinian Nakba, what happened in 1948 and why it still matters, uh, featuring a very special guest, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, who's joining us, uh, as well as a, a stellar panel of experts to be uh, helping us better understand these issues and how they relate to the situation today. Uh, before we hear from Congresswoman uh, Tlaib, um, let me just uh, say a couple words of acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to, in particular, thank uh, Nadia Sah and Project 48, our co-host for today's event. Um, Nadia has played a critical role in, in this event, and it's no exaggeration to say that it, this event would not be happening without, uh, without Nadia's um, uh, support. Um, Project 48, which is the organization that Nadia runs, was established to educate Americans about the Palestinian Nakba as the origins of Palestinian dispossession, a process that, as we're going to hear, continues to this day. Uh, Project 48 believes uh, that a substantial peace, uh, sustainable peace, can only be achieved in the presence of justice, which in turn requires us uh, to learn about and address and acknowledge the impact of the Nakba on Palestinians. Let me also say a word of thanks uh, to the other organizations that are co-sponsoring today's event, the Foundation for Middle East Peace, the Institute for Palestine Studies, uh, and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, a quick overview before I hand over to MEI President Paul Salem to introduce the Congresswoman. Uh, just a quick overview of the, of the format. Um, after we hear from the Congresswoman, uh, we'll watch a short video uh, then we'll go straight into our panel discussion. And after that, we'll open the floor to audience uh, questions. Uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen uh, to submit your questions. Uh, with that, I will hand over to MEI President Paul Sa. Uh, thank you, Khalid, and thank you uh, for putting together this uh, very timely and important panel. Uh, when you say that the uh, Nakba of 1948 is still relevant today, uh, it's really relevant today in the literal sense, as our colleagues uh, from the region are telling us, there's uh, even more escalation in and around Jerusalem today in a very, very tense situation, many decades after this crisis uh, first uh, emerged. Uh, it's my pleasure and an honor to, to welcome uh, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule on a Monday uh, to the be with us, uh, as all of you know. Uh, Ms. Tlaib is a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Michigan's 13th district and been in office since January 2019. Uh, she's a member of the Democratic Party. Uh, MEI itself is, is very much a nonpartisan organization, but uh, we are starting a process reaching out to leaders and officials from both parties, both the Democratic and Republican parties, to engage them on their views, particularly on Middle East policy and uh, Middle East issues. Uh, Representative Tlaib is known as a champion for progressive causes in her native Michigan and in the U.S. House of Representatives. She's used her influence as a political leader and a lawyer to work for social justice and equality. She's the first woman of Palestinian descent in Congress, uh, the first Muslim woman to serve in the Michigan legislature, and one of the first two Muslim women elected to Congress. Uh, her parents are both uh, from Palestine uh, she herself uh, was born uh, in Detroit. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Wayne State and a Juris doc uh, Doctor from Thomas Cooley Law School. She works on the committees of uh, finance, natural resources, and oversight and reform. Uh, uh, and just in April, with her colleague Representative Dingle, uh, she introduced the Arab American uh, Heritage Month. Uh, it's an honor to have you with us today, Congresswoman. Uh, particularly on this very critical and sensitive issue. Congresswoman, over to you. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, and thank you to the fellow panelists, um, who will, many of which will speak of their personal experiences in working for uh, Palestinian human rights. So ahlan wa sahlan to all of you. Thank you to the Middle East Institute and the Foundation for Middle East uh, Peace for in inviting me, of course, the other number of organizations involved. Uh, as you all know, I'm an unapologetically Palestinian American Congresswoman who stands strongly against apartheid 
and all forms of oppression. Today, we come together to shed truth about the Palestinian Nakba that began in 1948, where over 750,000 Palestinians were forcibly displaced from their homes and lands. As we come together at this very moment, we are seeing the Palestinian Nakba continue as we watch Palestinians in Jerusalem being physically removed from their homes under Israel's current leader, Netanyahu, and his racist and violent agenda continues. As a Palestinian American in Congress, I have been told by some colleagues who disagree with my fact-based truth about segregation, racism, and violence in Israel towards Palestinians. They continue to tell me, quote, directly, I need to know the history, they would say to me. What they mean unintentionally or not is that the history of the creation of Israel being told to one generation to another erases the truth about the Nakba. This is a foundational moment for the Palestinians and so many that are so interconnected to that form of oppression. As we talk about our history, know that many of my neighbors in Detroit and beyond may not know what we mean by Nakba, but they do understand to be killed, expelled from your home and land and stripped of your human rights. My ancestors and current family in Palestine deserve their history to be told without any obstruction or lies. They have a right to be able to explain to the world that they are still suffering from Nakba when the world watched with no intervention. The land confiscations, home demolitions, expulsions are just part of the painful journey of the Palestinian people. The dehumanization and feeling less than on your own homeland is traumatic and can be seen in Palestinian children being raised under this unmanageable, unimaginable condition. When I discuss Palestinian, the Palestine plight for freedom and human rights, it comes from not only being born to Palestinian immigrant parents, but also as a person who grew up in one of the most beautiful blackest city in the nation where the civil rights movement was birthed. As an African-American Baptist pastor in my district in Detroit always remind us all, reminds us all that we are a country that's not divided, but disconnected. And I believe this is so relevant to the Palestinian human rights movement. The freedom of Palestinians is connected to the fight against oppression all over the world. We must work together to end racism of all kinds and end the erasure of indigenous Palestinians from their historic homeland. We must, with no hesitation, demand that our country recognize that unconditional support of Israel has enabled this erasure of Palestinian life and the denial of the rights of millions of refugees and emboldens the apartheid policies that the Human Rights Watch has detailed so thoroughly in their recent report and Israel's own leading human rights group, Beth Salam, has also labeled apartheid. I applaud our country to reinstate support and funding for UNRWA, which provides essential education, health, and employment services to millions of Palestinian refugees. But we cannot at the same time continue to enable and finance the policies that created the Palestinian refugee crisis in the first place. And they imperil that their lives are under and deny the right to return home. And that ultimately increased violence and racism towards Palestinians. So I leave this with all of you as you listen in to know this, to know our history is critically important, but how we connect it to those also being oppressed around the world is how we can increase this movement to understanding that it is connected to each other as humanity. And so I ask all of us to make sure that as we stand up for Palestinians today and sharing the history of the Palestinian Nakba, that we do it in a connection with so many others that continue to be oppressed or have similar history. And so with that, I thank you all so much for this credible opportunity to address all of you. And thank you again to the panelists who shed light and personal um, human story about what it feels like to live under apartheid. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congresswoman, uh, for such a powerful statement. One of the things that, that we like to do in the Palestine program at MEI is to highlight and amplify voices and perspectives and issues that don't typically get uh, very much attention in the Washington think tank community. And so we, uh, that's you know, one of the reasons we are putting together this event. Um, and, and we're delighted to have you join us. Um, so we're going to um, 
before we hear from the panel, we're going to watch a short video, um, which is a, a testimony from a Nakba survivor uh, from, uh, from Deir Yassin. Deir Yassin was a, a village near Jerusalem uh, that was attacked by Zionist militias in April 1948 um, and completely uh, depopulated in addition to a, a massacre that took place in that village. Um, her name is Fatma Radwan. Um, we're going to hear Fatma's story um, to help ground our conversation in the reality of what happened in 1948 um, and that we are seeing today in places like Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Jarrah in, in Jerusalem. Um, uh, the threats of further expulsion of Palestinian families uh, as so on as, as we are all aware. Uh, Fatma's story also speaks to the generational impact of the Nakba and the resilience of uh, Palestinian refugees who've been denied their right to return, but who continue to dream about and struggle uh, to return home. Uh, Fatima um, has uh, recently passed away in, in the fall of last year. And so this uh, video is in many ways in her honor. هذا من ليلة تبعنا لحالنا أنا كنت عمري ثمان سنين كان الساعة خمسة كنا نايمين دخلوا على البيت ورش أبوي قتلوا أمي راحت أسيرة جبت أخوي ومشيت من السرير نروحنا مع جيراننا قربنا وإحنا مهاربين على عين كارم في اللي سيد عمره سبعين سنة كان مقتول ومرمي في الأرض أثرت فيها سيدي أبو أبوي وقتلوا جميع الناس منهم خالي أخو أمي كان عمره ثلاثين سنة أطلعوهم من البيت وصفوهم كلهم صف واحد للصهاينة ورشوهم عمة حرقوها هي وولادها حرقوها في البيت تكون الحياة يعني مشت في صعوبة ولحد الآن ولا أزال أذكر ديال ياسين رحنا زرنا الدار أنا وبنتي وبناتها رقطت لوز منها Our house was beautiful Back in 1930s, it was a two-story. Dariusin was known for its uh, pure air, and it was high up in the mountains, so it has this very serene type of environment. And then we asked to see the house, they said, no, we didn't see it, it was just from the front door. Oh my God, oh my God. I mean, I don't know the feeling. I felt a lot, a lot. لأنه تذكرت أبوي تذكرت كثير أبوي بكيت كيف كان يقعد ويحط هالأرجيلة ويقعد على البرندة كان كان يقعد عليها ويأرجل طبعا البيت أثر فيا كثير البيت تذكرته كل إشي بتذكره إشي صعوبة يعني كانت ونروح على المدرسة ونيجي مع أحلى كانت هاي أنا كنا عمري 15 سنة فيها هاي زينب Data describes the story how she recounts it she does it without any kind of hatred in her heart so for someone who lost so much from there it's interesting to see that she doesn't have intolerance of people that were intolerant to her there's a lot of suffering but there's also a lot of hope and resilience that's there too i'm definitely gonna go back and i always tell my kids i'm gonna be that ship that anchors in the sea and hopefully i will bring them there i'm gonna do everything in my power to get some of the land back it'll be multi-generational go for years <laughs>
Uh, thank you so much, Khaled, for that. Um, I'm delighted and honored to introduce our amazing lineup of panelists for today. Dr. Rashid Khalidi is an Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University. He has served as advisor to the Palestinian delegation to Madrid in 1991. Uh, Khalid is author of uh, Khalidi is author of eight books, including his latest, The Hundred Years War on Palestine. Lubna Shumali is advocacy manager of Badil, which is the resource center for Palestinian residency and refugee rights based in Bethlehem. As a Palestinian human rights defender and activist, she advocates Badil's comprehensive rights-based approach to refugees and internally displaced persons, as is defined by international humanitarian and human rights law. Omar al Ghubari is a Palestinian group facilitator, a political educator, and lecturer on Palestinian history, identity, and the Nakba. At Zuhrot, Omar leads work on reconceptualization of return, as is the imperative redress of the Nakba. Omar also coordinates and guides Nakba return tours in destroyed Palestinian towns and villages. Muhammad al Kurd is a writer and poet from Jerusalem. He is studying and teaching in New York, but is joining us from Sheikh Jarrah, where he and his family are facing imminent expulsion from their home by Israeli settlers and the Israeli government. With that, we are going to get started with this panel. We're really humbled and honored to have all of you here, and I will pass it on to Khalid for the first question. Um, thank you, Nuran. Um, Professor Khalid, if I could start with you as a, as a historian, um, the Nakba obviously is not a one-time event, but a series of events that took place beginning uh, in late 1947. Um, could you give us a sort of brief overview uh, of how events unfolded, uh, the scale of displacement and destruction that took place, uh, and, and how those events shaped Palestinian national consciousness uh, afterwards? Sure. Um, thanks so much for having me, and thanks to Congresswoman Tlaib for that very moving uh, introduction to this event. Um, the Nakba uh, is what Palestinians call basically the destruction of their society in 1948. It involved the flight and expulsion of three quarters of a million people, three quarters of a million Palestinians from their homes. Most of those homes were destroyed uh, thereafter. Um, what we call the Nakba or the catastrophe uh, was the result of the establishment of a majority Jewish state in a country that then had a two-thirds Arab majority. Given those demographics, expulsion was always considered vital to the creation, I repeat, of a Jewish majority state in what was then an Arab majority land. It was the logic of Zionism that produced the Nakba. Um, this expulsion has often falsely been described as a result of the war between Israel and the Arab states that started with the establishment of Israel on May 15th, 1948. In fact, over 300,000 Palestinians were expelled long before then, long before the Arab armies became involved in the conflict. Um, 60,000 people were driven out of Jaffa, including my grandfather and my family. 60,000 people were driven out of Haifa, Arab Palestinian Arabs. 30,000 people were driven out of Arab West Jerusalem, the Arab parts of West Jerusalem. Uh, most of these people uh, were, uh, of these 300,000, as I've said, were expelled before um, the uh, formal Arab-Israeli war started. And then another 450,000 were expelled thereafter. Um, what did this lead to? One thing it led to was Israel's destruction of over 400 abandoned Palestinian villages. Arab urban areas in West Jerusalem, in Jaffa, and in Haifa, and in other towns and cities uh, were taken over. All Arab property abandoned by people who had been driven out during this ethnic cleansing was seized, confiscated. Today's conflict in Sheikh Jarrah is a direct sequel of these events. Um, the Palestinian people who are about to be expelled from their homes by Jewish settler organizations with the support of the Israeli state are descendants of, and in some cases themselves, refugees uh, from Arab areas of what is now Israel, driven from their homes in 1948. Under Israeli law, they cannot return. Under Israeli law, they cannot claim their property, while Israeli Jews can make property claims in East Jerusalem. So what we're seeing today in Jerusalem is a direct result of the Nakba. Palestinians consider that this is an ongoing event. 
it is not something that happened in 1947-48. It's something that happened in 1947-48 and is still happening as we can see today in Jerusalem. Thank you, Dr. Khalidi. And before moving on to the next question, I'd like to make a correction. I unfortunately misread Muhammad's bio. So I just wanted to quickly reiterate that Muhammad al Kurd is a writer and poet from Jerusalem occupied Palestine. He's studying in New York, but he's joining us from Sheikh Jarrah, which, as we know, uh, is facing attacks from fanatic settlers and the Israeli government and authorities. So I just wanted to uh, make that correction before moving on to Lubna. Lubna, in the same breath, we're speaking of Palestinian refugees. Can you talk to us about the status of Palestinian refugees today? How many are there? Where are they located? What are their legal rights under international law? And what are the challenges that they face? Uh, thank you, Nuran. Um, Palestinian refugees today number 9.1 million making them the largest and most protracted uh, refugee population in the world. And this came about because as uh, Rashida said, that because we have an ongoing Nakba. Israel has been diligently working since before the Nakba in 1948 to effectively cleanse Palestine of its indigenous Palestinian population and has been fairly successful. Uh, during the British mandate, 150,000 Palestinians found themselves displaced outside of mandatory Palestine, many of them denationalized by the British mandate itself through some of the legislation that they passed. Another, another 750,000 found themselves displaced outside of what came to be called Israel and uh, had, uh, were exiled to what became the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and then the countries surrounding Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. About approximately 40 to 60,000 Palestinians became displaced internally inside what came to be called Israel. Then when Israel occupied the rest of Palestine in 1967, another 500,000 Palestinians were displaced. Uh, so that combination of the continuous forcible transfer of Palestinians outside of mandatory Palestine combined with the denial of reparations, which is the primary right that they are entitled to as victims of an international crime. Forced displacement and dispossession, uh, forced displacement and transfer is considered a crime under international law. The mass displacement of the indigenous population of Palestine is also considered a crime in and of itself under international law. And as with UN Resolution 194 that was issued by the United Nations in uh, December of 1948, all of these individuals, including their descendants, have the right to reparations. The right to reparations involves four components, voluntary physical repatriation, property restitution, compensation, and guarantees of non-repetition. But before I get into that, or I think that's into the next question, the situation of Palestinian refugees in their host countries is very severe. Uh, we can talk about the situation in Gaza with the blockade, the dire humanitarian crisis that has been created by that blockade and three subsequent wars on Gaza by Israel. We could also talk about the situation in Lebanon where Palestinian refugees are being denied their most necessary civil, political, um, cultural and uh, economic rights. Uh, we can talk about the situation in Syria where we now see uh, an internal conflict, even uh, marginalizing Palestinians more than they were in the past. Uh, we can talk about the situation in the West Bank as well. Um, as parent, there are degrees uh, to the, um, the crises or the obstacles that Palestinians face across the globe. However, the rampant discrimination and racism against Palestinian refugees has not abated. Uh, for example, during the crisis in Syria, Palestinian refugees were denied refuge uh, in comparison to their Syrian counterparts. And this was a, not an official position of most countries, but ended up being uh, the practice of most countries, including Arab states, as well as uh, the European countries. In terms of what they are entitled to until they are allowed or they have the opportunity to exercise their right of return. They are entitled to live in dignity until during the period of their displacement and to facilitate the, 
the um, the um, servicing of their needs, the United Nations created UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. Um, UNRWA was in the news recently and has been quite uh, regularly, particularly because they are facing a budget deficit caused by the um, non-support or the lack of support of states to provide them with funds in order to be able to implement their most basic programs. When UNRWA first started, they were providing um, basic needs, uh, humanitarian aid and assistance, things like blankets, uh, tents, food, clothing, medicine, etc. But as the refugee situation became more protracted, UNRWA began to, uh, uh, developed into a service delivery organization. The services that UNRWA provides are mainly education, and we see that in the numerous UNRWA schools that are located mostly in Palestinian refugee camps. Uh, within the Arab region. Uh, we see it also in the health centers that they have also created uh, to provide health care to Palestinian refugees. Um, and also they provide uh, social services and um, assistance for extremely impoverished or marginalized Palestinian refugee communities. Because of the steady decrease in the funding of UNRWA, these services have been shrunk they have lost both quantity and quality of service. And this is particularly evident, evident as well with the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic. Palestinian refugees are not being uh, provided with the um, humanitarian aid and assistance that they are entitled to. Note that they are entitled to this assistance and it's not a situation in which this is considered a charity situation, but rather this is what they are entitled to as victims of an international crime, that being forced displacement and transfer, and that crime being perpetrated uh, by Israel. So overall, the Palestinian refugee situation is, is quite dire in some areas more than others, uh, but the overall situation does not, does not bode well or look good. Thank you, Lubna. Um, Omar, if I could turn to you for, for a moment, uh, Israel has never acknowledged the Nakba or its role in, uh, in creating it, um, the, the, the Palestinian refugee problem in general. Tell us what your organization, Zuhrot, does um, to raise awareness about the Nakba in Israeli society, uh, what sort of reaction that work uh, gets from government, civil society, and ordinary Israelis, and why you think it's important for Israelis to come to terms with the Nakba as a historical event. Omar, Omar I you are muted. Yeah, I noticed that, okay. So thank you, first of all, for having me and organizing this panel. Um, the organization that we are talking about that I work with uh, is Zohrot in Hebrew, which means remembering. And um, um, the necessity of uh, this organization is because Israel never acknowledged uh, the, uh, the Palestinian uh, Nakba and the responsibility uh, um, uh, on, the, on the Nakba and the uh, catastrophe, including the refuge of the majority of the Palestinian people. Um, and Zohrot was founded um, 18 years ago, uh, by the way, by mainly Israeli Jewish activists, non-Zionist Israeli Jewish activists, in order to raise the awareness among the Israeli Jewish society about the Palestinian Nakba and the uh, um, eraser of the Palestinian uh, localities, towns, neighborhoods, cities, villages, um, that used to stand uh, um, in the landscape that had been Judaized and Hebraized and Israelized since 1948. So we, um, uh, we know that the Israeli uh, systems, different systems, the, of course, the educational system mainly uh, will not teach the Israelis um, um, uh, about this part of history. Of course, they will not mention the history of the Palestinian people um, in, in order to uh, shape uh, the Israeli narrative, the Zionist narrative, and to educate Israelis as the um, uh, the ongoing victims of the Palestinians, uh, in, instead of teaching the facts and what happened to the Palestinian people that disappeared suddenly in within 
few months from this uh, from this area. So in this uh, uh, field of ignorance and denial, Zohrot was uh, founded uh, in order to um, to 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 expose or to to um, to educate what is unseen in the landscape, mainly mainly for the Israeli uh, uh, society, uh, and to do that in Hebrew. Uh, of course, uh, I think this is the only organization maybe uh, that does that uh, in Hebrew in order to deliver, to, de to mediate the Palestinian history, the Palestinian Nakba to the uh, occupiers, to the decolonizers, to, to the colonizers. The goal is to, to decolonize, to, to decolonize the, uh, uh, the perceptions, the, the terminology and the knowledge that people uh, uh, mainly have. And it's not easy uh, uh, mission. You can imagine that we are facing uh, the uh, first of all the majority of the Israeli uh, uh, residents that believe very deep believe on the Zionist narrative and the Zionist uh, uh, approach, and we face the uh, the strong systems, the governmental. Uh, uh, um, um, work and uh, um, def definitely successful work that the the government does among the Israeli uh, Jewish society and of course the Israeli mainstream media. All these systems are cooperating in order to oppress the memory of the Palestinian people, the history of the Palestinian people, and the facts uh, according to the Palestinian uh, existence till uh, in 1948. Uh, by the way, even um, uh, uh, oppressing the, the the information about the uh, uh, the Palestinian the Palestinians who became citizens of the state of Israel, what we call, or many people call, the Arab minority inside Israel, or the Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel, that as Lubna mentioned, 25 percent of them are IDPs. They, they were. Uh, physically uh, expelled from their original villages and towns and never had been allowed to return uh, uh, to these places. So uh, what we try to educate people that are living in this landscape, many times they even live very close to Palestinian ruins and Palestinian uh, 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 partly destroyed houses or uh, uh, some evidences from the uh, Palestinian life, but they don't see that. They don't ask questions about it. They don't want to understand different uh, uh, reality. So what we try to do, how to educate the Israeli uh, um, blind society or blocked uh, um, mind of set of this society uh, is to do gradually cracks in their perceptions, in their uh, uh, concepts, uh, um, uh, regarding the knowledge about the landscape that they live in. We started to tour, to walk, to visit the destroyed Palestinian villages and towns and to invite people who are interested or curious to understand where they live to see the ruins. And we walk with them, we teach them what was there till 1948 and, had, and how the Palestinian community from this specific place had been expelled. Um, if this work uh, uh, achieved uh, the crack that we wish, I think um, in many meanings we, we, we do, we do achieve. Uh, I can compare, for example, the, the, the mentioning of the Nakba in the Israeli mainstream media 15 years ago uh, to the situation today. Today, there are many articles and many material and many mm, 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 talks about the Palestinian Nakba, even using the term Nakba as we use it in English and Arabic in Hebrew. It, it entered the, the, the Hebrew and became one of the terms that they use uh, uh, without any need today to explain what it is. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, they had mentioned that very rarely, but also to explain to the Israeli readers, it, it means what the Palestinians claim happened to them, or the word in Arabic means one, two, three. And uh, today we can see that uh, the mentioning of the Nakba is, 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 is more common. I'm not saying that every article that mentioning the Nakba means necessarily 
they support our approach or they acknowledge the responsibility of Israel on the Nakba, but at least they talk about it. They cannot anymore avoid it. Let's uh, say that this is one of the achievements that the Israeli society in these days, 70 years, 73 years after uh, the establishment of the, st the state of Israel, they cannot avoid the Nakba anymore. As one of the researchers said, uh, maybe in the first 50 years, they ignored and they denied, but now, they cannot do that. Maybe they can justify it, but they cannot uh, avoid it. Thank you so much, Omar. And I actually will mention to the audience that Zuhrot has an app called I Nakbe. Uh, I know many Palestinians, including myself, have actually used it before to follow up on the status of towns and villages that our family members come from. So I would highly recommend that you check it out. On the topic of the Nakbe and the ongoing Nakbe, I want to address this next question to Muhammad, who's speaking to us really from the heart of everything that has been happening in the past few days in Jerusalem, which I'll leave to him to really discuss with us. But Muhammad, as we've uh, been discussing in the panel, the Nakbe is often described by Palestinians as an ongoing event, that the threat of being uprooted or displaced is something that is just as likely to happen now in 2021 to Palestinians as it was in 1947, 1948. Can you speak to us about what is happening to you and your family right now in Sheikh Jarrah um, and how it relates to the broader Palestinian cause and to the question of the Nakba and the question of displacement that every Palestinian can really identify with. Thank you, Nuran, and I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to say thank you for everybody listening, particularly in occupied Palestine, be they in Gaza occupied Palestine or Jerusalem occupied Palestine or Haifa occupied Palestine. Um, to answer the question, the story of Sheikh Jarrah is a microcosm of Israeli settler colonialism across historic Palestine. And although it's bizarre and absurd to describe to people, that there is a settler that has taken over half of my home and has been living in there for the past 12 years, that there is a settler organization that is registered in the United States that is billionaire back that is working tirelessly to dispossess me and my family and other people um, from the neighborhood, 550 people from the neighborhood. It's not so bizarre when you contextualize it, when you, when you contextualize it with how the Israeli occupation came about in Palestine 73 years ago. Um, so I think that's that's the biggest um, issue. I think also this, what makes Sheikh Jarrah significant is this the length of the story. We've been in this um, legal battle, so-called legal battle for since 1972, which I believe is 49 years. And during that period, Israeli settler organizations have not only harassed and bullied us, but they've collaborated and colluded with the Israeli government and the Israeli occupation authorities to intimidate us and harass, and harass us and take over our homes in a way that seems like it's legal, but it isn't. Um, I think it's also important to remind people that under Israeli occupation, the Israeli judicial system is an inherently colonial one. And all the Israeli ins institutions are seemingly independent uh, of one another. They all tie back to Israeli colonialism of Palestine. Um, and I say this as a person who's lived under this rule, who's seen the Israeli judicial system side with the Israeli settler organization time and time and time and time again, not only in Sheikh Jarrah, but in Silwan and in the South Hebron Hills and all over. They can just get a legalized order of ethnic cleansing and expel us. What's happened and what's ma what makes the Nakba different today is that the Israeli occupation authorities were able to replace artillery and weapons with a judicial system that is inherently supremacist, with a, with a judicial system that was built by and for Israeli settlers to uphold a Jewish dominance in Jerusalem. That is the case. And when we talk about this, we are not saying anything that's controversial or, or a conspiracy. This is something that's been said time and time again by Israeli officials, by Israeli government um, officials, by Knesset members, by high ranking officials in the Israeli municipality. You see this in the urban plans of the Israeli of the Israeli municipality of Jerusalem, where they talk about maintaining a Jewish domin dominance in the city, and what that translates to is forced displacement, dispossession, and it's not only the loss of property that we suffer from in Sheikh Jarrah and across historic Palestine. 
where people's lands are being stolen by the Israeli regime. We are also experiencing psychological terror because these so-called legal processes take decades and decades and decades and they financially, um, they financially drain us, they psychologically drain us, they drain us of our humanity, they also drain us of our prospects. My grandmother, Rifq al Kurd, was kicked out of her home in Haifa in 1948, and then again in 1967, and then again in 2009 when settlers took over half of our home. And had she been alive today, this would have been her fifth or sixth or seventh or God knows what Nakba. And if that's not a uh, if that's not verification that the Nakba is ongoing, I don't know what is. I think it's also important for me to say that the Nakba is not only ongoing, it's reoccurring to you. It can happen to you as a person more than once. I know so many, including my father, my grandmother, so many of my family, so many of my neighbors who have been made refugees twice and three times. Even I'm, I'm only 22 years old. And should they take our home in the coming weeks? This would be my second Nakba. So I don't think it's it's what Palestinians um, consider or what Palestinians narrate. I think the facts on the ground show us statistically that we are losing our homes. And if it's not just losing your home, it's getting your home demolished. And if you're not getting your home demolished, you're getting expelled from the country or you're getting exiled or you're, you're losing your Jerusalem residency. And if you're not losing your Jerusalem residency, you're being imprisoned or you're being um, exile. So yes, I think the Nakba is ongoing. I think another another thing I'd like to speak about is what comes with this Nakba. It's not just, you know, we talk about Sheikh Jarrah in the media and oftentimes we hear the word eviction. And I think eviction is bad no matter where in the world. I've lived in Atlanta for three, for four years. I've lived in New York for a few months and I know that gentrification and eviction is a real threat. But when you think about eviction, it's not what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah because eviction does not imply that an army of settlers and an army of occupation forces lock down the entire city, bring down the skunk water trucks, bring down tear gas canisters and stun grenades and blow up your doors and break open your gates and throw your kids from the second floor bed from the second floor story homes. Uh, and throw your furniture from the second floor. This is what eviction means for us in Sheikh Jarrah, and that is what eviction has meant since the inception of Israel. It's a violent, violent, violent event. These displacement events are, are very violent. In the past few months, we have launched a social media campaign um, called under the hashtag Save Sheikh Jarrah to try and save our homes, which we've been trying to save for decades. And we are amazed by the international grassroots and local and regional organizational support for our campaign. Um, and we're also amazed by the developments on the ground. We are seeing our attempts to save our homes from ethnic cleansing be met with brute force, with fascistic police brutality. Um, in the past week, my brother has been arrested. So many, maybe 10 of my neighbors have been arrested. So many of my my friends have been arrested. Our neighbor Saleh Diab has had his leg broken and then the next day he was arrested. His children are terrified and panicking. This is, this violence is a settler, is settler violence. And when we say settler violence, we are talking both about these settlers that are coming in from God knows where who have Brooklyn accents and can just come and storm our homes. We're also talking about the occupation forces who are colluding with the settlers and supporting the settlers and defending the settlers and having the settlers point to them which Palestinian they'd like picked out, beat up and arrested. So the Nakba continues because Israel is allowing for it to continue because the Israeli regime is in complete collusion with these settler organizations. There is no other way. There is no other way an Israeli settler organization can come and take over somebody's home had it not been for the Israeli state allowing for that to happen, had it not been for the Israeli state um, ignoring Palestinian documents, Palestinian ownership um, documents and just taking Israeli documents, settler documents that have been fabricated or falsified in a lot of cases at face value without even challenging them or um, falsify or, or, or authenticating them. I say this, I say this from Sheikh Jarrah and I say this with a lot of um, a lot of fury in my heart, but also a lot of love and support for all of the people who are finally waking up and realizing that the occupation is 73 years old. And for 73 years, Palestine has been crushed by this by Israeli colonialism. I know this because my grandmother, 
um, had dementia a few months ago before she died at the age of 103, had dementia, could not remember me, could not remember my father, could not remember anybody from our family, but she remembered the battles. She remembered what the Zionist militias did to her in 1948. And that's an indication of the ongoingness of the Nakba, because even if it doesn't happen to you twice in your lifetime, it still haunts you in your, in your head. It still haunts you in your heart. And, you, and it's the first thing you think about when you first wake up. That is what, what it means for the Nakba to be continuous. I'm so grateful to be able to speak to you today, and I hope um, you have a great rest of the webinar. Thank you so much, um, Hamad, for um, what I know is a, it's a extremely difficult time for you. So we very much appreciate you sharing your, your perspective with us. If I could stay with you for, for a minute um, and ask you to give us some uh, a little bit more um, perspective on the situation in Jerusalem where these policies come from, but also if you could give us an update uh, in terms of the legal battle. You know, we read yesterday in the, in the news that uh, the Israeli high court has uh, delayed a decision for 30 days. What does that mean uh, for, for these imminent uh, uh, expulsions like, like your family? Um, is that a result of international pressure? is, uh, you know, what, what more can the international community do uh, at this point in the coming 30 days? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, where these policies come from, we have a, we have a colonizer and colonizers are going to colonize. It's no surprise that colonizers, that Israeli colonization has implemented racist laws that allow them, that allow them to take place in a, take action of ethnic cleansing in Sheikh Jarrah under, um, under the guise of the law. That's what colonizers have done in South Africa. That's what British colonizers have done in the colonies they um, invaded. It's, it's what colonizers do. I think it should be implied. What it meant that the Israeli judicial system has postponed our court case for 30 days, it means that our, our pressure um, is working now. I don't think that's. I don't think that's. That means that we have. We are victorious. I don't think so because this is. A, this is a twelve. This is forty nine years long battle. But in my in my participation of this battle, this is a thirteen long. This is thirteen year old battle. Um, and we've seen it happen and come in waves. And we've seen. And the entirety of my life have revolved around going to Israeli courts going to the Israeli system and figuring out what's going to happen to my house and it hasn't changed much so we don't know what's going to happen in the next 30 days I think our pressures should be doubled and tripled I think government I think people all around the world are doing an amazing job raising this issue and I think people all around the world are doing an amazing job connecting this issue particularly the police brutality um, section of it to other places like the United States and Colombia and other places but I also think governments, although they have condemned this, I don't think the condemnations are strong enough. I'm so, I would, I, I love and welcome the tweets, but I want to see more. I think it's time for governments to sanction Israel. I think it's not a, I think, I don't think it's an outrageous request that Israel be sanctioned for the atrocities it has committed against Palestinians. I think that's the next step. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um for your really, you know, it's stepping out of my panelist role a little bit. But um, Lubna, I'd like to move to you next. As we know, the hope of returning is extremely salient for Palestinian refugees wherever they are in the world. Uh, we're often told, though, that significant return for Palestinian refugees is infeasible, uh, would mean like the end of the state of Israel. There's, there's many myths uh, around the Palestinian right of return. Um, can you speak to us? How plausible is the right of return for Palestinian refugees? What are the modalities of return? How would it look like? Is it ultimately feasible? Um, I know at Badil, you folks have been doing a lot of work on this issue. So I think myself and the audience would love to hear how Palestinian return uh, is envisioned for the future. Uh, sure, Nora. Um, it's not only feasible, but it's absolutely required in this case, as it is in the case of many situations in which displacement and forcible displacement and transfer has occurred. Reparations means to repair, 
to restore as much as much as possible to once was. And reparations is provided as a dictate or an entitlement under international law to victims of international crimes. And as I mentioned previously, forcible displacement and transfer is an international crime. Another international crime is colonization. And we cannot deny that colonization is occurring in Palestine. And another international crime is apartheid. And we cannot deny that apartheid is also occurring in Palestine. Israel is a colonial apartheid regime that has used forced displacement and transfer to create a demographic, an unnatural demographic composition in Palestine. One of Israeli Jewish colonizers <coughs> and Palestinians. However, as I stated before, Israel has not been successful in effectively creating a demographic majority. If we look at the entire population of mandatory Palestine today, we will note that only 50.3% are in fact Israeli Jews, while 49.7% are Palestinians. So they are nowhere near the demographic majority that they, that they require uh, or that they desire uh, under their colonial apartheid regime. As I said, reparations is not just feasible, but it's also mandatory under international law. The reparations package that is offered to victims of forced displacement or, and transfer, or in other words, refugees and internally displaced persons both. In this case, the 9.1 million Palestinians who have experienced, as Muhammad said, multiple situations of displacement and transfer. It, it's a, comprised of four components and they are not divisible. It's a package. So it's actually all four components must be used in a reparations package. One is voluntary repatriation or return. The other is property restitution, which requires the reclamation of all original property lost. The, four, the third is compensation for both movable and immovable property, as well as psychological damage and uh, emotional stress as well as satisfaction, which is the fourth component or guarantees of non-repetition. In other words, creating a situation in which um, the forced displacement and transfer, the crime that was committed is not allowed to recur again. That's what reparations in principle means. Reparations in practice, when it is implemented, needs to happen under detailed political agreements. Now, some people would argue that we have a detailed political agreement through the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords make no mention of any Palestinian right at all. Not the right to exist, not the right to life, not to freedom of movement, not to freedom of religion not to uh, residency, not to family unification, not to access um, services and natural resources. All of these basic rights were devoid in Oslo. There's nothing in Oslo that speaks to Palestinian rights. It also doesn't speak to the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people, the right of return and the right to self-determination. So any political agreement that is devoid of these basic rights, as well as the inalienable, inalienable rights of the Palestinian people, those rights that do not expire, that's what inalienable means, they do not expire, and they cannot be derogated from, they cannot be dismissed by anyone, Palestinian authority, uh, the government of Hamas, the international community, Israel, the United Nations, the European Union, these rights cannot be derogated from. And those are the right of return and the right of self-determination. So we need, we need detailed political agreements that ensure our individual basic rights as well as our inalienable rights and how to dismantle um, or repeal the discriminatory legislation contained within the regime that violates these rights and commits these international crimes. It also requires the participation of rights holders, the victims, the refugees, and the internally displaced persons to determine the best types of solutions uh, in order to implement their reparations. Uh, of course, we need international support and political backing, and this is what's lacking. 
Um, I noticed a question on one of the chats that says, how do we bring Israel into compliance with international law when Israel is unwilling and continues to deny the Palestinian right of return? Well, the most obvious solution is the one that uh, Muhammad raised, and that's sanctions. Uh, third party states are obligated to bring perpetrator states into line with international law using a variety of means and mechanisms, one of them being imposing, imposing sanctions on the state uh, committing the crimes. Now, sanctions were imposed against a number of countries, mostly Arab countries, for example, Syria, um, uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, and so on and so forth. But what but the political will is lacking among the international community to impose sanctions against Israel. Um, we need a comprehensive legislative framework to review the mechanisms that we are going to use in the uh, implementation of Palestinian uh, reparations. We also need to develop a system of return and restitution grounded in the rule of law and international law does provide specific guidelines in order to, to do this. And we have significant examples or historic examples that we can learn from. For example, the situation in former apartheid South Africa. We also have the example of Cyprus. We also have the example coming from former Yugoslavia. So it is common practice among states to provide reparations packages, not only to victims of other international crimes, but also specifically to refugees and internally uh, uh, displaced persons. Now, it should be noted um, that within the reparations package, many people speak about what is called durable solutions. And the durable solutions that international law talks about are three, are, there are three uh, accepted durable solutions. One is return or voluntary physical repatriation. The other is resettlement in another country where the individual takes on the nationality of that country or um, local integration where the individual becomes a uh, part of the uh, national group of the host country. Those other two durable solutions, uh, resettlement and local integration are not rights, not the way that the right of return is a right. They are dependent on the uh, goodwill of states and they do not, and if they are given individually to refugee and IDP populations, it is not considered an exercise or a access to their right of reparation. So the only way to move forward in Palestine and achieve what um, international or what is desired, in other words, um, uh, sustainable peace, sustainable and real peace without the structural violence that Muhammad was talking about, without the uh, colonial apartheid regime that is designed to create a superior group, that being Israeli Jews and an inferior group, that being Palestinians, Without the dismantling of that legislation uh, and without the exercise of the right of return of Palestinian refugees and internally displaced persons, we are nowhere near achieving any type of peace, not only for Palestine, but also uh, throughout the whole region and globally as well, because Palestinian refugees reside in almost every continent on the planet. We are not talking about a, a, a local crisis that is um, that is uh, limited to the um, borders of mandatory Palestine. We are not talking about something that is limited to the Arab region. We are talking about something that is that is international. And this is particularly evident when uh, we talk about secondary displacement or reoccurring displacement, as uh, Muhammad so eloquently put it. Thank you, Lubna. Um, Professor Khadidi, if I could... Um come to you and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, what we've heard so far in terms of the feasibility of international sanctions, the feasibility of dismantling this legal infrastructure uh, that has allowed for these, these kinds of policies. Um, but I'm going to throw at you another question as well, um, because I'm, I, I particularly want to hear your thoughts on what the international community response has been um, has it been adequate? I'm talking about the current crisis in Jerusalem. Um, and, and of course it relates to, to more broadly, what has been the international response? Um, and, and also if you could touch on the Palestinian leadership 
uh, and the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the role that they're playing. We're not really hearing a whole lot from either Ramallah or Gaza at this point. Um, uh, so the question about the international community, specifically uh, the Biden administration and also on Palestinian, the Palestinian leadership. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think it's very clear that the international response, of, response has been entirely inadequate. Um, I agree with, with what Mohammed said. I agree with what Lubna said. Uh, what's really required is sanctions. Um, what you have here is egregious, egregiously illegal behavior. Jerusalem is occupied territory. The settlement of the of the occupying state's population in under the Fourth Geneva Convention in occupied territory is illegal. That has to be sanctioned. Not only does it have to be said, the Biden administration has not, and I'm afraid will not say that, occupied Arab East Jerusalem is occupied territory. Israel settling its population in occupied Arab East Jerusalem is a violation of international law. Israel should be sanctioned. Uh, and if the United States can't do it, others should do it. And there are multiple forms of sanction. Uh, if it can't be gotten through the UN Security Council, there are other things that can be done. So the international response to not just what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah in May 2021, but what has been happening in occupied Arab East Jerusalem and obviously in other parts of Palestine uh, since June 1967. In, in a month, it'll be 54 years that Israel has been colonizing, Judaizing, and settling occupied Arab East Jerusalem. I'm not even talking about the rest of the West Bank. I'm not talking about what's been happening in Palestine since 1948. Simply there, it is necessary for the, the, the fact that this is occupied territory to be recognized by all and sundry. And I, 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 I can't say how inadequate these bleats of, of, of distress from European capitals or other capitals are. This is irrelevant. What they say is irrelevant unless and until they do something um, I really think that, uh, that they should be condemned for their inaction in the face of what now everybody can see is happening. I mean, Mohammed has described in detail personal, the things that he personally and his family have experienced, uh, how the Israeli military, how the Israeli state has basically operated as the arm of the settlement movement or the backbone of the settlement movement. This is not a group of people claiming property. This is not a group of people claiming a residence. This is a forcible colonization, systematic. It's been going on for 54 years of occupied Arab East Jerusalem. And it's, it's bloody well about time for somebody to say that the United States should do something about that. Let me come to some, one other thing about the United States. Many of these settlement groups, it's disgraceful to say, are in American law, charitable organizations. They are 501c3s. Donors to them get tax exemptions. They don't pay taxes, so we can pay taxes, so the United States government can support Israel in carrying out these atrocities, while these organizations get ample funding from the United States um, to expel families like Mohammed's. This is something that can be closed by the Treasury Department tomorrow. These are not charitable organizations. These are organizations engaged in systematic violations of international law and in occupied territory. Unless and until that's recognized, I don't care what the president or the vice president or the or anybody else says. I think something has to be done about this. And this is just one of many, many things that could be done. And the United States has to recognize again that East Jerusalem is occupied territory. Uh, in the past, that was American policy. That that, that there's been a slow, steady move away from that. Uh, and I, I have to repeat something that Lubna said, which I think is really important before I get to the, your question about Palestinian leadership. Um, she talked about all of the rights which were not included in the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords were a huge con. They were a huge shell game. And they started from a formula whereby the United States and Israel colluded in saying that everything important, all Palestinian rights without exception, were considered final status issues to be negotiated later. So all the rights that Lubna described, every single one of them, national rights, human rights, civil rights, religious rights, were rigorously excluded from the negotiations, both in Madrid and Washington, and later on, which I participated in, and later on uh, at Oslo. So these are, not, these are not in any way, manner, shape, or form legitimate agreements. 
in terms of a resolution. They do not, you were not allowed to talk about these rights and they do not form a part of the Oslo Accords. Where is the Palestinian right to self-determination in Oslo? Doesn't exist. Where's the Palestinian right to return? Doesn't exist. Where's the Palestinian right to consider Jerusalem Palestine's capital? Doesn't exist. And we could go down the list. Lubna did it very eloquently. So I think that those kinds of things have to be recognized before anybody goes back to a faked up so-called peace process, which has essentially been a process to enable Israel to carry out this colonization of occupied territories uh, at, while the United States holds everybody away and, and basically ring fences Israel's colonization process. That's what Oslo enabled. Um, you've asked a question about the Palestinian leadership. I have to say, given the scale of what's happening, the Palestinian leadership is Palestinian civil society. Palestinian leadership is people who are standing up, whether legally or through demonstrations or through staying in their homes or staying on their land uh, or fighting within Israel for their rights. There is no Palestinian leadership. The Palestinian national movement is in abeyance. The people who claim to be leaders of the Palestinian people do not deserve the merit of being called leaders. They have failed utterly to provide a national strategy. They have failed utterly in whatever efforts they may have made to achieve Palestinian rights. And I think they should leave the stage. Uh, they, they don't deserve to be called leaders, neither in Ramallah nor in Gaza. Whatever they say they're doing, it's essentially been uh, uh, driven by a, a desire to perpetuate their own power and status and privileges uh, and external support, which all of them enjoy from different international actors. Uh, a free election in which Palestinians were told Fatah, Hamas, none of the above, none of the above would probably win because most Palestinians recognize the utter bankruptcy of both sides in terms of unifying Palestinian ranks and in terms of putting forward an internationally recognizable strategy so people can support us. It is, it's up to people like Mohammed, it's up to uh, organizations like Zakhrat, organizations involved in advocacy for Palestinian rights, PACB, uh, the Boycott and Investment Sanctions Movement, students, they are the leaders. In practice, that is where leadership of the Palestinian people comes from. The people who claim to be leaders and drive around in Mercedes and, and BMWs and Audis uh, uh, really should be disgrace, disgracefully condemned for what they haven't done, their failures, and should leave the scene. Uh, it would be better for them and better for the Palestinian people. Uh, and that's not something that will perhaps happen tomorrow. But I think that what we see in terms of activism uh, is, is, the, is the future. And I think that it's, it's remarkable that a term like Nakba, that discussion of issues like settler colonialism, a discussion of what Zionism really means is finally entering global and especially American Western public discourse. I think it's a sign of the, of, of the beginning of the shifting of the tectonic plates that have always been in favor of Zionism in Israel in the past. Um, the very fact that we're having this event the very fact that a member of Congress has addressed us, the very fact that there are literally dozens of members of Congress who have come out in favor of bills that would halt Israel's uh, American support for Israel's demolition of Palestinian homes or halt Israel's detention of Palestinian children. Uh, and there are many other things that can and should hopefully uh, be demanded of the US Congress. Um, the fact that, that the US Congress is, is willing to allow the kinds of things that are happening in Sheikh Jarrah to happen. The weapons that are being used all over to suppress the Palestinians are, are frequently American weapons. The money that supports the Israeli military, the $3.8 billion is American money. And the 501c3 tax deductible quote unquote charities, which are engaged in, in expulsion of Palestinians from their homes, theft of Palestinian lands um, are, are things that the treasury department could switch off literally uh, with, with, with a single uh, 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 stroke of the pen. So um, I, I think that, I think that uh, we, we, are, we are actually maybe at the beginning of, of a change uh, in the way this thing is, is seen. And I will hope, I, I'm hoping that it'll, that it'll sooner or later, uh, to go back to your first question, lead to real action um, by international actors and not just meaningless uh, uh, bleating of condemnations that have no, have, uh, Israel doesn't care about being condemned. Israel has been condemned by the Security Council and by international actors uh, since its inception in 1948. They don't care. If the money keeps flowing and the weapons keep flowing and the United States will prevent anybody from doing anything in the Security Council, they don't care. 
uh, it, it, action is required. And action is particularly required of the United States and Europe, which have always been the metropole of this settler colonial project. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Khalidi. Uh, Khalid, did you have a follow-up question? I mean, I kind of, I know we're pressed for time. I, I'm, I was sort of wanting to press uh, Rashid a little bit on the on this question of leadership, because is it enough to have, um, you know, civil society stepping up? I, I think as you know better than most, it's times when Palestinians don't have a coherent political leadership that bad things happen. You know, I'm right. referring specifically to that period in the 1940s um, that kind of uh, enabled uh, the Nakba to happen. Um, right. So is it enough to simply say civil society and the, the youth and, and so forth? No, no, it's not, obviously. I mean, I would much, much be much happier if there were a unified Palestinian national movement that was able to forcefully represent Palestinian, uh, uh, the Palestinian position. Uh, I just don't see that happening in the near future. And in, 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 into that vacuum has stepped civil society. It's very clearly not sufficient or adequate. Uh, I, I cannot wait for the day that we have a, a Palestinian national movement that represents the, the aspirations of the Palestinian people and that has dignified uh, young leadership. Uh, this generation that runs things now has failed and it should leave the stage. And, and I, I, I can't make it do that. The Palestinian people can't make it do that. Um, but uh, until and unless that happens, unfortunately, that vacuum necessarily is filled um, by civil society organizations and people like the young people in Jerusalem um, who are standing up to defend the Al-Aqsa Mosque, who are standing up to defend people's homes from being taken over by uh, 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 Israeli settlers. Um, I, 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 I very strongly hope that in the, in the very near future, the Palestinians can develop a unified stand with a unified leadership. But uh, very clearly, as we saw from the fiasco of the elections, the existing corrupt and bankrupt leaderships are not uh, uh, immediately gonna allow that to happen. And until and unless it does happen, we're stuck with this vacuum, which is being filled by very courageous civil society actors. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khalidi. The next question, is, it's a bit two part, it's for Omar. Uh, Omar, what is the process that Zohrot goes through to uncover a former Palestinian village uh, and find out what happened to it? And have you ever had a Palestinian go on one of your tours to see their own former village? Uh, the follow-up to this question is that we're often told that there's no room for Palestinian refugees in historic Palestine anymore. This is the common myth against uh, the Palestinian right of return. But according to the Palestine Land Society, the majority of former villages actually remain untouched, either in Israeli national parks, off of Israeli highways, or in closed military zones. Uh, what is the status of these former villages, in your opinion, as someone who's seen them up close? And do you believe that it's feasible that millions of refugees can actually count on actualizing their right of return to those specific villages that they're grandparents or great-grandparents specifically came from? Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, first of all, the, uh, the most important guides and the first guides that teach us about the uh, former villages and uh, in Palestinian neighborhoods are the refugees or the IDPs themselves. Uh, till today, Zohrot um, uh, published uh, 64 booklets talking about the history of different uh, 64 Palestinian localities, destroyed Palestinian localities, and all of them, including testimonies of Palestinian refugees or Palestinian IDPs. Um, I, um, I do interview the person before we, we visit the place in order to, uh, uh, to collect the testimony, and I will go with the family to the original place and in order to observe what is uh, in, in, in there. It's, it's not correct that the majority of the Palestinian villages are untouched. All of them have been touched. Uh, but if you mean they are not populated by Israeli uh, colonizers, that's correct. The majority of Palestinian villages inside the, inter the, the, the JNF parks or the uh, national parks or forests um, uh, are hidden inside among these, these trees. And we can uh, see when we go there, we look for 
the ruins and the stones, and of course, the cemeteries. The cemeteries became one of the most important evidences and, and, and uh, um, uh, symbols of the Palestinian uh, uh, villages. And of course, the cactus. So, so many of us know uh, a little bit about the cactus, the strong trees that if Israel did not destroy and build buildings or streets or highways, or on them, they will in increase and they will be uh, green uh, all the time. And through the cactus trees and other ruins, we can actually find the location of the, uh, uh, of the Palestinian destroyed or erased villages. The, uh, the Palestinian old men and women, when they come to their village, original village, uh, and the, the, the village is not there, by the way, and in most of the cases, uh, they will look at the area and they will compare where the uh, location of their house or their school or the water spring war, was located according to the cemetery, for example, or to the, the street, the closest street or some of the trees. And they, in all the cases, then when they came there, they became very active and they walked very fast among the ruins and uh, they, they, they had a process of reimagination of the place and they actually revive the place in their description and they tell us where almost everything was located and we uh, with, with their help with their memory we can actually uh, um, locate the uh, uh, the village on the uh, on the ground in the landscape, which is very very amazing process that had been done by the refugees themselves and of course by by us and by the uh, uh, others who are observing the refugees looking for their own uh, uh, own house. We document this process. Uh, we 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 film the 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 um, the visit. And when we come and invite people, and we already documented that in the booklet, um, we try to put a sign uh, or signs on the uh, on the, in the location with the original name of the village. As you already know, the eraser included the eraser the eraser included the names of the Palestinian uh, um, uh, villages and, and towns. And instead of them, we will see signs. Uh, having new Hebrew names or Jewish names. So we try to decolonize the signs and we put our own sign with the original name um, and in order just to, yeah, to, to give chance to the ghost of the, uh, of the Palestinian uh, villages to be there at least for a while, because when we go back to that place a few days after, we will notice that some Israelis came to the place and uprooted the signs. They even don't have the ability to to see the the, the signs with the with the original name of that of that place. So, uh, uh, answering your question, yes, we all the time when we had a research about certain village or town, we will have a Palestinian family, original family, or refugee uh, will come with us. Uh, in the recent few years, we have little difficulties. Unfortunately, many of the uh, uh, refugees are passing away. So we, we, we try with the second generation and even the third generation uh, um, to, to make uh, ongoing visits, ongoing uh, um, uh, 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 tours to these places without the original personal uh, uh, refugee, but their descendants. And uh, uh, I think this is also very significant uh, process among the Palestinian refugees. Now I'm talking about the Palestinian IDPs because the second and third generation carry this memory and this history and this knowledge and continue the same process. Even they will take the process and the resistance against the denial of the Nakba one more step further. They talk about the return and the practical return. They are not talking only about the past and about the memory and about the sorrow that they uh, know uh, uh, as a result of the expulsion and the ethnic cleansing. They talk about how we can go back to our uh, original place and to continue the ideas that Lubna mentioned in the beginning, we are conducting workshops with Palestinian young IDPs 
and sometimes with Israelis who are willing to talk about the right to return as a uh, 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 um, crucial part of the uh, correction or the redress of the justice that should be done in the in the future. And instead of talking in theory about the right, we ask them to imagine, to revision the uh, uh, the landscape, including return. And we did that with help of with architectures, with writers, with singers, with many tools in order just to give this uh, uh, way of thinking uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, a shaped uh, um, lesson or, or process that we will lead, but who will decide the refugees themselves and the IDPs uh, um, themselves. Unfortunately, we looked in the literature, of course, in the political uh, uh, demands of the Palestinian leadership, we didn't find any plan for how return will look like and how we want to implement uh, 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 our return. I think that what we try to do the, the, in the last years and Badil, uh, uh, where Lubna works, uh, started also, and some researchers, Dr. Salman Abu Sitti recently, uh, doing the same work in order to put the practical and the visible right uh, uh, the visible return on the table uh, in order to promote the, uh, the the political vision, not only for acknowledgement and uh, declaration of responsibility, but also to uh, uh, to give plans how it will look like uh, in, uh, on the ground. Thank you, Muhammad. Um, I think we have we're just about out of time, and I know we have so many more questions. Mm -hmm for all of you. Um, I think we have time for one last question for Muhammad, and then um, unfortunately we're gonna have to, to close. Nuran, do you wanna? Thanks so much, Khalid. Uh, and it is unfortunate that we're running out of time. Muhammad, uh, we just wanna ask you and give you the final word. What can we expect in the next month, given that the Israeli court order has been delayed or the Israeli hearing uh, for the Sheikh Jarrah families has been delayed? And kind of touching on this recurring point of Palestinian leadership, what do you expect uh, of Palestinian leadership? What could they be doing to be more supportive of the Sheikh Jarrah families? And really any final notes that you have, we'd love to hear from you. Um, in the next 30 days, we are going to double our efforts in the Safe Sheikh Jarrah campaign. Um, I want it to be very clear that we don't only want our homes not to be stolen. We want our neighbors' houses, Ghawi and Hanun and the other Kurd family, Shanti family, um, and uh, half of my home to be returned as well. So even if the evictions miraculously get canceled, we would like to return our houses. This is a movement that is never going to stop until we have everything we want back. Um, I encourage everybody watching to engage in this campaign and amplify our voices and continue um, to say save Jarrah and continue to say no to ethnic cleansing and to continue to say no to Israeli colonialism. Um, I just want to take a minute to say that I'm in complete solidarity and mourning for the three children lost in Gaza just now by Israeli terror, just now. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have much, I don't have much to say. I, I know that it's um, long overdue for our people to be liberated, for the siege to be lifted and for the occupation to end, for apartheid to end and for the Israeli colonialism to end. And it will end even if that meant we will end with it, but it will end. Um, thank you all, and I appreciate you having me. I don't want to take too much of your time. Thank you so much for your time. It was an honor. Thank you, Mohammed, uh, and thank you, uh, Professor Khalidi. Uh, thank you, Lubna. Thank you, Omar, uh, for uh, you. Know, we barely scratched the surface, but thank you for giving us your time in this very, very important topic, uh, important and timely topic. Thank you all for joining us, um, and thanks uh, particularly to our co-hosts, uh, Project 48 and our co-sponsors, the Institute for Palestine Studies, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Uh, and with that, we hope to see you again very soon.